Welcome to the pop-up exhibition series of the Magnus. And uh, this week we continue to explore research paths that are uh, carried by students that work here. And um, each time we do projects like the one that's presented today, it's like a group of concept. In this case, the ingredients uh, on the counter of our ideal uh, kitchen were a set of rather obscure manuscripts that have very important visual components and textual components. And two collaborators, a graduate student, an undergraduate student, a graduate student fellow, and an undergraduate involved in the undergraduate research pro uh, program, apprentice program, yeah. The URAP, it's horribly called URAP. But it's a, it's a great program this semester. We have 11 undergrads working here. And uh, they're both here, Zoe Levin and Yosef Rosen. They've been collaborating since the fall. And so they're presenting their preliminary, still preliminary results of their, of their findings and their research. And we meet regularly and, and review and critique everybody's ideas. And uh, what's happening in through this whole uh, research process is actually also conceiving an exhibition. They were planning to present in the main gallery of the Magnus next year, in, in the spring semester. <coughs> so this is really preparatory work for more to come. Uh, obscure ideas, interesting and fascinating texts, and uh, the ability to actually articulate them in public and to communicate even with those who are not familiar with this uh, material. So, best of luck and congratulations for all the work that you've done. Please join me in welcoming Zoe and Joseph. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zoe Lewin. I am a senior at UC Berkeley studying rhetoric and art history, and this is my third year at the Magnus. I've been here since fall of 2013. I've worked with our postcard collection. I've worked on two exhibitions, including Living by the Book, that's out in the main gallery. And for the past year, as Francesco mentioned, I've been working tirelessly with Yosef, um, plowing through our GBT collection. Hi, everybody. I'm Yosef Rosen, a sixth year PhD student here at Cal in Jewish Studies. And I focus on Jewish Kabbalah and mysticism. And that's kind of how I got dragged into this beautiful collection was, I think about exactly a year ago, I gave a, a pop-up presentation here about the collection's amulet. Uh, the Magnus Collection has some 30 to 40 metallic amulets. Um, one of them uh, papers, you can see in the back right there. And Francesco and I were kind of thinking maybe we would create a exhibition on the amulet to kind of talk about Jewish magic. And eventually Francesco said, well, let's do something that's even more complicated than Jewish magic. And so what we got ourselves into was working on Jewish shibitis, which we'll talk about, which, as we'll, we'll show, integrate certain components of amulets and magic, but really open us up into broader questions of what is Jewish visual culture. Yeah, and I, before we continue, I just want to thank again Francesco and Julie for all their hard work and helping us make this possible. So, at the beginning of this project, Francesco mentioned to me that I would be working with this Jewish scholar and graduate student, Yosef, and he sort of brought me into this project. I had no idea what GBTs were. I'd seen them in some flat files and storage. I knew they were maybe Kabbalistic, like Jewish mystical art pieces, maybe. Um, and I remember in preparation for this presentation, I went through my notebook um, and I looked back and found notes from the first meeting I had with Francesco in September. And I found that he had given me a run through of the basic markers of a CVT, which is what exactly what we're going to do in this presentation is go through component by component and really break down the integral pieces of the devotional work. So, Shibitis have a very interesting and slightly complicated history that we're going to try to break down. Um, so the first component of the Shibiti, and really where it gets its name from, is from a verse in Psalm. Shibiti Adonai Tamid, Psalm 16, verse 8. Um, I place the divine, the Yudhei Bhakti, the Tetragrammaton, uh, before me at all times. Yeah. So, about the Tetragrammaton? Yeah. Yeah, so the Tetragrammaton is the UN 
Hey Vav Hey, it's the ineffable name of God, one of the many names of God, and it's often, as we found in the collection, which we will scroll through in a few slides, um, bolded, made larger than the rest of the words on the Shiviti plaque. Um, and in that regard, the, sh the Tetragrammaton has this sort of double performative power. So as the scribe or the artist who's creating the Shiviti plaque is, um, is writing down these words, he or they or she are enacting the very words of Psalm 16.8. I am placing the Lord before me always as they write down the yod heh vav -Hey. And then the viewer or the one who's like meditating on this plaque is also always placing the Lord before them as they meditate and just like look at this devotional plaque. Yeah. And as you'll notice with the Shiviti is that it's all made out of letters and it always usually has the, the tetragrammaton in bold. And I think one of the ways to think about this is when you think about Jewish art in general, um, Jewish visual culture, you know, there is, there is a desire to create a depiction of God, a desire to create an icon of God that many other religions um, actualize. And in Judaism, there's a very strong prohibition against creating any image of God. And so one of the ways that the Shiviti plaques um, kind of strategize around getting around that prohibition around creating icons of God is through using language, through using names and letters. And so by using the name of God, you meditate on the name of God, and that kind of becomes a linguistic icon, so to speak, for meditation on the divine. Um, the second main central component of every Shiviti is that they include Psalm 67, a different psalm, in the shape of the menorah. Yeah, so the seven branch candelabrum um, will often appear larger, um, not usually underneath the text of the Psalm 16.8, not necessarily. The format is pretty loose. Um, and oftentimes, we'll actually see more than one um, menorah or seven branch candelabrum with different psalms or Kabbalistic texts. Um, the one that we have up front, um, the really big one, has um, Kabbalistic prayer on a bekoach, for example, but it's pretty uh, non-exclusive. Yeah, and this, this tradition actually goes back before the, the rise of Shemitah plaques. It originates in 14th century Italy. Um, where in, often in the title page of a Siddur, it would include a minorah, but written in letters of Psalm 67. And Psalm 67 has eight verses, and so the way it works is usually the, the, the first verse, so I'm going to say, I mean, you know, is on top, and then the next seven verses create the seven branches of the candelabrum. And it's probably an attempt to kind of synthesize together the older temple form of Jewish prayer, which the candelabrum exemplifies, with the, with the post-temple form of prayer, of praying words of psalms. And so by using <coughs> psalms as a way to draw the menorah, it's kind of very ingeniously weaving together temple worship and prayer worship, prayer worship. Can you tell us what, what it says in Psalms? Psalms, you want me to tell you what Psalm 67? The, the menorah. Yeah. It's written out of Psalm 67. It's a blessing for prosperity and safety. And, yeah. So this is a little historical schematic that we drew up to kind of help us think about the history, the genealogy of Shiviti. And what we found, and other people have noticed this too, is that Shivitis actually have a, a few predecessor stages that originally as we said, you have this 14th century tradition of just having the menorah with Psalm 67, but those don't ever include Shiviti Yudhibab the Nebi That tradition began in the aftermath of Lurianic Kabbalah in the 17th century, when Lurianic Kabbalah, which is a mystical movement, became popularized. And one of the main components of Lurianic Kabbalah was an emphasis on kavanot, on certain intentions when you were praying that you would really want to focus on different divine names and different energies of the divine for different prayers. And so there arose in the 17th century this practice of writing out the tetragrammaton on a little piece of paper and keeping it in your siddur. 
And so you would visually have it in front of you and you can meditate on it while you were praying. And those two different, tr different traditions, one from Europe and one from Italy, kind of merged together, we don't know exactly, but in the 18th century in the context of Hebrew books. And do you want to say something? Yeah. The, the earliest one that we have from 1802 uh, from Palestine, you see it's in the context of a book. It's not yet a plaque like these are. It's part of a book. And this is in the introduction to a book called the Sotset of Rashto, we have a commentary on the sea door. Yeah. Um, so they converge kind of still in the context of Sidurim prayer, but now beyond the menorah, they also include the Shemiti. Um, and it's only in the 19th century that then we start to see the spread of this as an independent art form, as uh, in plaque that we put on your wall. And that's really what our um, collection has is primarily we have about 34 plaques from across the diaspora uh, in the 18th and 19th century that's really traveled all over Morocco, India, and this really became a popular religious format of combining the menorah and the sheep. Well, let's go back to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this specific Shiviti um, has an interesting history that we'll sort of delve more into, but it's kind of cool. Originally, we had in the Magnus records that it was from Iran, um, but then through a flicker and a digital sort of publication of this information, we discern through another Jewish scholar who found this work that it was actually from Alexandria. Um, but this Shiviti is kind of fun in that it uses um, like lithographic techniques and it employs like these weird sort of decorative decals. Um, and yeah? Yeah, sadly it was too delicate to present right here. Hopefully it will be part of the exhibition. Yeah, the, the floral decals are really interesting because they really show that this was an aesthetic thing. This is really about beauty. Um, so this is a Shiviti. So you see on the top the Shiviti Yudhe Bhav the Nekvi and the three different Minorot. Um, but what's interesting about this object, and in general one of the things that we notice when we study Shivitis is that we don't just learn about Jewish theology, we actually also learn a lot about Jewish cultural history. Um, from learning about who created these things, why were they created, why did they circulate. Um, and that is kind of coded in the bottom section of a lot of Shivitis. And so I thought it would be helpful to just break down a little bit what's going on here in the bottom. Um, I wish I had a laser yeah. thing. Um, um, so it says on the top right, it says that this is the handwork of Yaakov Meir, the son of Abba Shalom Kishioth, who the, who's the scribe, and it gives the year. So here is where you have the scribe's signature and the year it was made. Okay. Then here you have something really interesting. Kodesh Lashem, this is sacred to God, for the synagogue, the Beit HaKnesset, Kodesh Lashem, Azuz Yavet, for the synagogue is Azuz Yavet, Me'iti Shlomo HaMechune Babajan Pinchasah. So this is dedicated by this really interesting rabbi, Babajan Pinchasah to a synagogue, Azuz Yavet. Um, so we don't really know how to put these pieces together. Is he donating it? Who is he donating it to? Where exactly is this synagogue? Um, and so one of the cool things that this my friend Noam noticed on the flicker is that here it says, Po No Amon, here in No Amon. So when I read it, I was like, I don't know what No Amon is. But he knew. No Amon is um, a reference to a verse in Nahum, Bible, where it seems to refer to Alexandria, Egypt, and already in Rashi's commentary and later traditions, Noah Amon became a name for Alexandria, Egypt. So we now know that this was made in Alexandria. Um, so this guy, Salman Pinchasaf, so he has one of my favorite names. He's known as the Rav Babajan, Kabuli, um, 1843 to 1927. 
Uh, so he's really interesting because he's one of the very first immigrants from Uzbekistan, from Bukharia, um, to Jerusalem in 1895. He really is one of the kind of the founders of the Bukharian migration um, from Asia into, into, into Jerusalem. Um, so he is not in Egypt, right? He moves from Uzbekistan to Palestine. And it seems like what's happening is there was this other Bukharian synagogue in Egypt, in Alexandria, Egypt, and he is then supporting the spiritual life of that synagogue by donating this shiviti to that other synagogue. And it seems likely that the, the, the scribe is also Bukharian, he has a similar last name, Kashiwaf. You can see that they both have the Vav Hey Sophia at the end of their name, which often indicates that they were a Bukhari. So, um, do you want to see why, why that's also significant about networks? Yeah, so I'm going to actually zoom out of our slide presentation for a second. Um, so, part of this project has been um, amassing a digital record for the magnets. Um, and the way that that's been done is we have a majority of these GBT plaques digitized and on our clicker, but a lot of my work was in making sure that all the metadata that was in the Flickr was also exactly correlative with the metadata that we have in our, um, our database. Um, so, and part of the project was creating an album on Flickr to sort of synthesize and bring together and show that this is a significant part of the collection. So I'll just scroll through and you can see that we sort of amassed this digital collection of shibitis. Um, and then I'll click on the specific shibiti that we're talking about and show how this sort of digital diasporic interaction occurred and it was after this really great um, digital scholarship. Yeah, so all these are actual shibitis that are in the archive over there. And these are the scans that we created. Sorry, it's like getting cut off. Um, yeah, so you can see, here we go, here we are. So here's the Shibiti, it's digitized, very high definition, um, it has 1090 views. <laughs> so here's like the format of, this is what I do, I spend a lot of my days doing, is going into these records and making sure all the information is up to snuff. The titles are all formatted the way they want them formatted. The database record is embedded. Um, and yeah, so we have a pretty extensive um, description. Yeah, is there a question? With uh, these photographs, you include uh, in the metadata the dimensions? Um, we, for the dimensions that we have, yes. That's what I mean, yeah. Yeah. Because I did see it right. Yeah, in this one we haven't. We're still sort of going through all of them. When you have a photo, it's like... Yeah, exactly. Which is really important because Yosef and I actually just were talking about this when we had, when we put these shibitis on display, we are like, oh my gosh, we forgot how big these two plaques were. Um, um, Noam Siena, a friend of Yosef, and he basically tells us that our information is wrong. <laughs> very politely. Um, and then... This led us to some further insights about the whereabouts of the specific synagogue from this Facebook post. Um, yeah, this Facebook post is talking about the different old synagogues in Alexandria, and it tells us that although they don't have any pictures of of the of the Azul synagogue, it's, it was already rebuilt in 1853, so it's, it's a pretty old synagogue. In, in Alexandria. Um, and so I think what, what's significant for us here is that we both see a historical network, geographical network between a Bukharian Jew living in Israel and a Bukharian community in Alexandria. But the research also led us to creating this new contemporary digital network of scholars and scholarship on the internet, which almost par parallels the circulation exactly. of the actual object, which we think is cool. Yeah. And so the second part of this digitization project is using, what's that? You went back to oh. Oh. Is using um, a platform called Findery. Um, and so 
with that platform, I've been able to embed all of our Flickr information and pinpoint on a global map where all of these CBT blocks come from, which has been a really interesting way to visualize the real, like the diasporic nature of these objects. Um, so we have one from New York, we have one, we have a few from Morocco, a bunch from India in the south, and also in Bombay and Mumbai, which is the one that we have presented. Um, we have from Egypt and Palestine and Iran and Greece, we have two from Greece, and uh, from Poland and Germany. So it's really, it crosses the boundaries of all aspects of Jewish life, Mizrahi, Sephardi, um, Ashkenazi. Yeah, and it really testifies to the popularity of this art form, that it was, it really satisfied a certain religious and cultural need, and it really spread just within a, a decade, within a century or so, across So this next uh, GBT that we're showing you, I don't really want to call it a GBT. It's more of a Mizrach with GBT motifs or themes. But just to backtrack a little bit, one of the most consuming parts of this project has sort of been the conceptual framework by which we're going about this project. Um, sorry. Um, one of the hardest things when dealing with Shibiti is the question of how to categorize the Shibiti. Is it an art object? Is it a devotional plaque? Is it for meditation? What is it? Um, and in sort of going through the process of answering that question, um, Yosef came up with this amazing taxonomical breakdown of all the different categories that a Shibiti could be within. Um, and we found that Shibiti is really intersect with a lot of different aspects of Jewish art. Um, one of them is the Mizrach plaque. Mizrach means east in Hebrew, and these plaques are traditionally posted on the eastern wall, the wall, the, the direction towards which Jews pray in the synagogue. And we have a few of these wherein it'll be a Mizrach, but then it'll also have clear indications that it's a Shibiti, and it sort of is like, are you just tacking on the Shibiti part? Are you tacking on the Mizrach part? But in this one, we're pretty sure it's a Mizrach and it kind of just tapped on the Shibiti just to further instantiate the holiness or the, the divine elements of this yeah, piece. The, the rainbow colors are obviously terrific. Uh, one of the odd things about this one is that if you notice the Hebrew, it says Shibiti Adonai. It does not say Shibiti Yudhe Vavhele. It doesn't have the tetragrammaton on it. It has the name that you would usually speak when you read the tetragrammaton. So that's an interesting little oddity. Um, and it kind of seems to show that it's no longer about meditating on the tetragrammaton. This has kind of just become a slogan that you can kind of just tag on to other formats of, of Jewish art, like, like the Mizrach. So here, there's like we've circled in on the Mizrach itself. Um, it's uh, cosmological, uh, it has these like, weird griffins flanking it at the bottom, um, but there's not really much else that I want to say. Yeah, about. this is the has the zodiac here, um, and some great griffins. Okay. Yeah. The other, the other um, way that Shivitis demonstrate this intersectionality of different formats of Jewish visual culture is in the relationship between Shiviti as a devotional and meditative object, and Shiviti as a magical object. And this is kind of getting back to where I said we began, originally thinking about the relationship between amulets and shivitis. So shivitis originally seemed to be about prayer, focusing, concentration. It seems odd that in many shivitis we find a lot of amuletic formulas that are about making sure that no harm comes to you, making sure that your child lives, lives healthfully, things that we would associate with magic. And how did this two different vectors of meditation and magic kind of come together is one of the ongoing questions that we're grappling with. And this beautiful Shibiti poster here um, really exemplifies these two different trends. Um, do, you want to say, what, do you want to say a little about what this is? Yeah. So this is a Shibiti that was dedicated, and we have like all the dedicated Cation information that we'll zoom in on in the next slide in the bottom half of this 
Um, Plot is dedicated to a wealthy family living in then Mumbai, Bombay, but now Mumbai, India. Um, we're pretty sure the community like gathered a lot of money and presented them with this plaque um, for their marriage. And another sort of element of like this project um, and working through um, our archive has been sort of to reestablish and reevaluate the physical descriptions that were given to these objects. Um, and when you write a physical description for any object in any museum or archive, the way that Francesco told me how to do it is write it as if someone who knows nothing about this object, no Hebrew at all, would be able to find it in an archive. And that is a terribly difficult task. Um, and as you can see with this manuscript, there is so much going on, which speaks to like, you know, the sort of weird hybrid nature that they sort of take on in the later parts of the 19th and 20th century. Um, but the best, like my sort of approach and one that Francesca sort of helped me come, come um, to use is breaking down the GBT into its component parts and talking about how the upper half depicts seven branch candelabras with like Hebrew script and then going into the bottom and talking about the different decorative motifs. So it's really, it's been a really interesting thought exercise for me in having to take a step back and look at these objects from a purely aesthetic um, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the fact that it's dedicated or donated to a family on the dedication of their childbirth kind of tells us something about the migration of this as a motif, that it's really now become a motif that you would give someone as a gift. It's no longer just something that you would create or you would commission for yourself to help you with prayer. It's become a much bigger to, uh, artwork, art um, trend. So the top half um, is the classical shiviti. You see the yud hei vav hei in the top in big letters. And here you have um, eight different um, menorahs with different letters, these cool geometrical patterns. Um, but it's in the bottom half that you get the really interesting stuff. Um, in this section, it gives the dedication to the couple, Menachem and Rachel. Um, no, sorry, to Moshe. Moshe. Yeah, and um, But at the bottom here, you have some really interesting stuff. Here you have this kind of mythical map of the world. It has the four cardinal directions in Hebrew, Mizrach, as we mentioned before, east, west, north, south, um, with the four rivers that traditionally go out from Eden, which is an interesting um, motif. And here you have a very clear um, magical kind of incantation in Aramaic. Uh, yeah, and so the language kind of shifts from Hebrew to Aramaic, for one second, and it's a very strong language. It's mashbia on the other hand. I like, I make the, I swear upon you, evil forces, to not come here and not harm the child. And here it's um, the opposite that he decrees upon um, the good forces to come and surround the family. Um, so it, it lets you really see the way that this motif really migrated um, aesthetically from purely meditational or devotional context to a more magical, protective. Um, and also, yeah, and also purely decorative with the like yeah. clear references to the temple, the Beit HaMikdash in gold paint. So also this is now an object that has accrued like a lot of religious iconography. iconography and also material capital. Yeah, and here you have the, the priestly blessing, so it kind of just becomes saturated with all different um, religious motifs. Um, is, it, is it always one artist? Or Almost always, as far as we know. One more? Do you have a quick question? Yes, I wanted to know more yeah. about the, the amulet, amulet and magical elements Great. and why, and also whether you have found um, some cultural history into the accommodation between the religious and the magical, and how they came to work together in a way when they're sometimes yeah. at odds. That's the rest of the, spot of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is um, another Indian uh, Shiviti that we have in our collection. And what makes this one really interesting is that it calls itself an amulet. 
says here, um, Kimia, which means amulet. Um, and it's written in the style of Misefer Raziel, which is a famous magical Hebrew book from the 17th century. Um, and this one, it, we can't really go through all the different elements, but it invokes a lot of different older Jewish magical traditions, invoking Joseph, who was thought to ward off an evil eye, um, different kind of what's quite common in a lot of these uh, Shivit is to have abbreviations of various verses or different angel names. And it's very clear that this is in, primarily an amulet, that it says here that it's an amulet against the evil eye, against the evil wind. Um, and yet it has all the classical motifs of a shiviti. On you know, at first glance, this is a shiviti meant to be meditated on to bring the divine presence closer. But in fact, it's it's more than that. It's also intended to kind of saturate um, the divine presence and use that saturation for magical effects. And to conclude. There is, I want to bring in a beautiful uh, piece from the Talmud that I think helps us rethink the relationship between the amulet and the sheep. So the Talmud says, how shall I interpret the words of Deuteronomy? And he shall write for himself Mishneh Torah, a copy of the Torah. It teaches the need of having two written Torahs, one to go in and out with him, the other to be deposited by him in his treasure house. This is actually talking about the king that the king of Israel would need to write, would need to have two Torahs. One would be a big Torah that he would keep in his treasure, but he needed one Torah to be mobile, to go in and out with him. The one that is to go in and out with him, he is to write it in the form of an amulet and attach it to his arm. As it is written, I have set God always before me. Okay? So the Talmud quotes this verse, Shivit Yadonai Nehu Tamid, to talk about the need to carry scripture with you at all times in an amulet. Rav Chana ben Bibna said in the name of Rav Simon the Pious, he who prays should behave as if the Shekinah is before him. As it is written, Shivit Yadonai Rav So here you have juxtaposed, I think, way before, a thousand years before this began as an artistic motif of using the verse of Shivit um, you see in the Talmud the way that this verse could lead in two directions. It could lead in the direction of an amulet, that you need to kind of physically carry scripture or the divine presence with you at all times, and this creates some type of magical aura around you that protects you from different demons and angels. Or you could take it in the more spiritualistic sense, like Rav Chana ben Bizna, who says that no, it's not about the materiality, it's about what it can invoke for you. It's what, he, what you need to do. He who prays should behave as if the Shina is before him. Something needs to happen within you. And the Shibiti is just a verse to help that happen that you could now visualize that the divine is before you. So it seems like long, long before any of this began as an artistic trend, the very verse kind of led in two different um, directions towards the amuletic and towards the devotional. And as we go forward, we're still trying to think through this question of how do these shivitis merge these different trends um, of meditation, devotion, and magic, how to think of those as different categories, um, and what do these objects tell us about Jewish aesthetics and the role of spirituality and Kabbalah and mysticism within um, artwork. Yeah. So. We'll take some questions. Ron? A few questions, but first just relates to uh, the statue you have written. Yeah. Uh, in Talmud, it says amulet. I'm curious what word it is. Kimia. Because it's using Kimia. 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 I just wanted to make sure because this whole process reminds me of skills also. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether there's any intersection there. Because it says to put it on your hand. Yeah. Right. What? Mm -hmm. The Mizuzah. The Mizuzah is on the building, not on your hand. Yeah. We did just, I did just see an old book that says that the mezuzah is the icon that tells you the outside of a house is Jewish, and the shiviti is kind of the inside of the house mezuzah. I don't know if that's right. Um, did you both do a question? Yeah, I have a couple other questions. One is, I'll just give them both to you. One is, uh, particularly using the text, I'm wondering how much, if, if you think, and I know these are relatively, whether there's much influence from Islam 
terms of you know writings, you know, you know, just uh, that it's anatomic also, just you know, but using letters as art form. So I'm wondering whether there's any influence one way or the other that you might postulate. And also, you, you spoke something about the intersection of temple and post-temple forms. You know, when they they do the temple, but this is so much later. This is over a thousand. really struck by how recent this developed and how in a matter of decades it's already found all over the diaspora. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was cool to see the interactive map and also the vignette about uh, uh, Baba John Pinchasal who mm -hmm. came from Uzbekistan to Jerusalem and donated one to Alexandria. Yeah. Did you uncover any other um, clues as to how it spread or what, you know, what accounts for how it diffused so rapidly? That's probably one of the most interesting, important questions. That was very interesting. Um, so I have a question about Mizrach. Mm -hmm. I thought Mizrach is in the direction of Jerusalem, right of the temple. Which direction do people in India have to face? Mm -hmm. 
And is it, is it wet? Or, or, and is it still or, cold well, in the dark? Or Persia. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not the other also story. an acronym, right? Oh, is it? Yeah. Mitzad, yeah. Ruach Elohim. Wow. I've never made it. And it's been basically all the way around. Right. I know. So they they speak first east? No. I don't think so. I think they would have stayed west. Even it it can change, of course. But uh, but uh, but again, it's orientational and it can be interpreted not as east. Uh, that's what I'm trying to suggest. Uh -huh. So it can it can vary depending on custom. So. Right, but it would be really interesting though if there was a mizrah hanging on the western uh -huh. wall yeah. of the house. Uh -huh. I also yeah. found it really interesting that um, when in, 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 in the big one, uh, we're used to having the form up, but the wall mm -hmm. uh, yeah. down and mizrah mahal. But this is completely new. Yeah, it's a mythic map. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do have a sort of a lingering question about the menorah, about the seven branch candelabrum. And which menorah is it? Meaning, which menorah described in the Bible is this referencing? Is it the one in the temple, or is it the prophetic vision of Skaria? Uh, is it, is it, which is a more mystical? And, uh, there is a good Italian link there because the, the you know there is the the, the Hanukkah uh, feud uh, which references the, the vision the prophetic vision of the it's, it's it's this very strange menorah with with it's a lamb but it also has water that flow, that right. flows into it so it's fire and water and then there are two olive trees next at the at the base and many of these have including the decals. Have uh, flower or plant motifs mm. at the base of the menorah. So I'm wondering mm. where where this structure yeah. originates from, and that that beauty is also Italian. It, it was written yeah. in Italy. I mean, I know with with decorated biblical medieval manuscripts, you would often have things from the temple, and there it was very clearly about mm. the messianic temple, mm. about Ezekiel's temple. So, so we might it might be yeah, we could compare. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm just. I'm just yeah. wondering with which menorah tradition and which menorah vision this is. Yeah, this are you saying that if it was eschatological, it wouldn't have that, mm -hmm. that what I was saying, that it's yeah. about connecting the temple prayer mm -hmm. with the... Yeah. Yeah. I guess it will relate, I was wondering, if it's two things. One, is Hezekiah, how they Thank you all. Thank you.